this is Archer Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story, hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at. Illusion is usually king. But in the battle for survival of Western civilization, it's going to be reality, not illusion or delusion that will determine what the future will bring. I have to remind you the views that are expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views, the views of our guests, and today we have with us an Alan Walker, uh, who is coming from on, on, Ontario, Canada, and he's uh, going to be talking about secret societies. And, of course, uh, today, anybody who talks about secret societies is relegated to the loony bin. Oh, uh, he probably thinks there's a black, you know, helicopters out there. He probably thinks there was a conspiracy behind the, the murder of, uh, of John Kennedy. Uh, uh, well, I think more and more people realize that there was a conspiracy uh, behind John, the murder of John Kennedy, and there really are black helicopters out there. And their CIA operations, they use these to terrorize people. And, and there are all sorts of strange things going on, and we're not getting the truth. But to understand anything going on today, you really have to understand there are secret societies, there are ancient secret societies that have been around literally for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so, with that as a background, Alan Watt, thank you so very much for being with us. It's a pleasure. How did you get started in this? This is sort of an unusual application. I mean, I fell into this, you know, 44 years ago. Mm -hmm. How did you get started? Well, I like to think that I was born with a form of autism which made me see things as they really were. <laughs> because uh, I grew up in Britain that was the inheritor of an empire, and I wondered why I didn't know anybody who was wealthy, and, and uh, except for uh, 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 two, two or three hundred families in London who seemed to have uh, raped and pillaged all of these countries, and um, and yet the rest of Britain was a sort of working class nation where everyone rented at the time. Um, they didn't have much money for anything. There was no credit available at that time either, no credit cards. Uh, very few people owned cars. So I said, well, what happened to the, this great empire? Where did all the money go? And when you went into the history, and I started early at school going into adult libraries and into the reference books, and I was lucky enough in Scotland to have a library which had books in the reference section going back to the 1600s. And uh, I was getting a different version of history written at the time to the one I was being taught at school. Well, of course, what they've really done, they've, they've censored the textbooks, they've censored the encyclopedia, they've removed so many facts from, uh, from our reality. And, and even uh, as in my latest newsletter, I'm pointing out that you try to get information from the Library of Congress, say on the Illuminati or, or Thomas Jefferson's associated mm -hmm. with that, and they will do everything they can to keep you from getting the truth. There are people who are, even today, censoring history. Oh, always. I think uh, George Orwell was quite correct where they were constantly updating the, the history in 1984, his book, and it, it went down the memory hole, he called it, to the furnace. And, uh, and then they rewrote it once again. And when you get into these old books and realize the massive, um, uh, how massively important these uh, secret societies were that, that exploded in Britain around the 1500s, uh, beginning with the Rosicrucians and John Dee and Francis Drake, uh, Francis Bacon, uh, and the Queen Elizabeth I court. And you realize that, uh, that they were all connected, they all belonged to the same lodge actually. And, uh, and most of the members wrote about it at the time. And uh, I had access to old books about them. About the Rosicrucians, and of course the Rosicrucians antedated the, uh, certainly the, the Masons, Masons of <coughs> 1717, somewhere there. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the Rosicrucians were there long before, and they played such an important part in the, actually, the creation of the country we live in today. Mm -hmm. And we see their emblem on the back of the dollar bill. The pyramid, mm -hmm. Catholic, yep. the Alting, I, but it's not theirs. Uh, that came from long before the Rosicrucians, mm -hmm. uh, the ancient plan of the ancient secret society. Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay. Our guest today is Mr. Alan Watt, and Mr. Alan has been 
studying, uh, I've met for many, many years, the background of the secret societies that really do exist and have existed down through the centuries. And having been raised in Scotland, he had the opportunity to actually go to the libraries there where they had an excellent section. They had not yet destroyed many of these older books that told about the Rosicrucians that were in England back at the time. Well, the Elizabethan time, we're talking about the late 1500s, the early 1600s, men like John, Dr. John Dee, men like, uh, certainly like um, uh, Francis Bacon, who uh, really was one of the men who was so instrumental uh, in the foundation of America. Not that he ever came to America, but he sent the Rosicruc Rosicrucian disciples to America to begin to shape this country so that, as it is today, America's wealth and military power could be used to bring about a world government. This is long planning by very wicked people who belong to societies who worship a different god. So, Alan, you pick up the story there, please. Well, when you go into the history of John Dee, who had the, the largest library uh, in England at the time, in fact, um, John Dee was a, a courtier at the, the court of Queen Elizabeth I, and he was also an advisor to her and an agent when he traveled abroad. And just by coincidence, his code number that he signed these letters by was 007. Right. And, and, and he laid out the plan. Uh, he was the first person to coin the term uh, a brightish, he called it B-R-Y, tish empire, should be formed uh, with, on a basis of free trade and, and with favored nation trading status. That's in the 1500s. And he said that countries that would not join this commonwealth would be excluded from, from uh, by taxation, by importation duties and so on, and bypassed in trade. And that was the beginning of this whole free trade business. Well, the Christmas was really about the plan to unite the world and British rule, wasn't it? It was, and, and he, he's even said in his writings that even though Britain would start it off, uh, someone would take over in the future and we find that happening in the early 1900s when Kipling came over uh, and he, he read his poem to the Senate of the U.S., uh, the one about the white man's burden and, and what they would have to do. And that was the handing over the flag, as he wrote in his poem, to you. We hand the torch over to you to and take over. Yeah. That was really what it was all about. America then would take over from Great Britain to bring about the New World Order, the New World Religion, and the destruction of all freedom. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Dr. Stan back here at Radio Liberty. Our guest is uh, Alan Watt, and Alan, pick up the story. Alan was just basically saying that th this whole thing had started with Dr. John D. back uh, in the uh, Elizabethan time, and, uh, and of course it continued through the British Empire, and then... Uh, Rudyard Kipling had come to America and read to the American Congress uh, his poem on the white man's burden. And, of course, that's the whole idea. The white men, uh, we just have to take over control of all these ignorant people throughout the rest of the world. And this then inspired this whole idea of bringing about a world government under Anglo-Saxon control. That's why whenever we are involved in military operations, the British are there. And whenever British is involved in an independent, uh, you know, military operation like the Falklands Island, why, the only country in the world that supported Great Britain was the United States, because there's this camaraderie going back to the secret societies that, uh, of course, is working towards this domination of the world and bringing them into a one-world government under our control. But it will not be a, a, a benevolent control, believe me. We are moving rapidly towards the police state in America, and they're doing the same thing in Great Britain and in Canada. You pick up the story. Well, once again, you find this tremendous movement down through the, the centuries, beginning with what they called Rosicrucianism and the underground stream. That's what, how they refer to themselves. And they also call themselves the Invisible College because they did have their own secret societies where they taught their members their part in the agenda. Uh, we find that Newton was a member of uh, the same society. And people know about Isaac Newton and that, that he was uh, primarily into uh, gravity, etc. But he was a, a high Kabbalist who lived in Cambridge all of his life. He, st he stayed there all of his life. And when they, they died, uh, they cleaned out his rooms and they were all... Uh, magical basically equations 
to do with, with Kabbalah. So, so these people have been heavily into the Kabbalah. People should realize that the Kabbalah, there's different versions of it, but they're all really tied together. The, the, it's not just a Jewish Kabbalah, there's a Greek, there's an Aramaic, there's, an, there's one from India. Because all the societies and all those countries are really one and the same. So of course, what they're doing is tying into the into this uh, this special wisdom, this this wisdom that is out there. When you uh, can communicate with the other dimension, and of course, this is really a demonic dimension. So uh, certainly, uh, we find that many of our great thinkers, like well, Thomas. Edison. Where did Edison get his ideas? Why well, he used to go into meditation. He was a disciple of Madame Blavatsky. And, and I think that we will find this with Tesla, with so many of the people. I, I did not realize, however, that, that Newton was into the occult as well. Oh, tremendously so. And, and he was also homosexual. It's in the history books in England. And um, he was he was bringing a, a boyfriend over from, from Italy at one point. Uh, it was called Fabio. <laughs> And uh, Fabio reneged on the deal, and uh, and Newton went to pieces for a while. But for his reward for working for the for the society, now he also worked for the Royal Institute, and that's the, that was the beginning of the the Masonic scientific establishment in England. It was chartered by the British Crown. It was given permission to exist by the British Crown, and you had to be a member to to join it. Francis Bacon was. Now the conditions of joining that institution was that if you were married you had to put your, your wife aside and, and family and leave money to them but never to, to see them again it was an all male thing only at that time um, and Bacon did that in fact uh, we, we find that Newton for his work in the Royal Institute Royal Society I should say his Royal Society um, he was given he was made the head of the British Mint Department they always give him a big payoff for, the, for working in the great work as they call it Alright, Father, what is that great work? The great work uh, you'll find going back uh, for thousands of years is to perfect that which was left imperfect. And this tongue in cheek uh, phrase they use is, is talking about the recreation of, of humanity itself, the, the reshaping of man. And, and they go by the laws of nature, and by the laws of nature they mean science. And they believe that they will conquer all nature and reshape it into serving themselves, the elite. And man himself, the workers, we find that this goes back to even Plato, who wrote about it in the Republic, where he talked about uh, the guardian class and then the working class. And the working class he called the its. And he said, these are basic building materials. He said, we can do the same as we have with domesticated animals. If you want tall people to pick apples, we'll breed a male and a female and keep interbreeding them till we have tall ones. If you want someone to work down a mine, we can uh, breed them short and squat and, and muscular for that task. And, and so basically, they're talking about a form of eugenics, reshaping society to serve uh, what they claim is the elite themselves, the illumined ones. Well, of course, you know, Pythagoras and uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and even Alexander the Great were all involved in the mysteries and the mystery of religions. And they had one form of teaching for the, for the common folks like us and then uh, another form for the elite. Yes. And, and uh, an, an interesting thing, too, is the, the tie-in all down through the, the many, many centuries with the, the banking system uh, with these societies has always been at the hip. And you, you'll find that even Aristotle's wife was um, a, a, a one of the international bankers of the time. His daughter married Aristotle, and Aristotle taught Alexander the Great. So you find the same tie-ins all down through history with the money system, uh, the lending of money to, na to nations to create armies and war, etc., uh, all go together and this conflict uh, creates the chaos and then they bring in the new order every time. And, of course, that is exactly what we're doing today as we expand the war in the Middle East. Oh, we're over there, of course, yes. countering democracy. But now we've got to attack Iran and, and who will be next and of course we're doing everything we can to inflame the uh, the anger and fury and distrust of the Islamic world after all you have to have an enemy if you're going to have a war and, and there was no animosity between the, the Arab and uh, you know the, the Muslim and the Christian as a whole uh, you know before uh, the CIA got over there and, and then we had all these things happening after 
And, and of course, nobody has ever asked why Building 7 came down. It had to have explosives in the base of it. It was at least a block away from the attack. There was no reason for Building 7 to come down mm -hmm. the way it did, just exploding at the base. So, obviously, we're not getting the truth, but uh, this then uh, set off a series of events, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, the coming war with Iran, and what will follow that? It's like deja vu all over again, isn't it? It, it is, but, and what we'll always find is these fellows write about their plan in it, but way ahead of it, almost like a legality, they're tremendously legal in a sense. It's not important the public understand what they're saying, but it's important that they actually give it information out in advance. And we find out, for instance, that, that, that uh, Papa Bush gave his speech on the New World Order on September the 11th in 1990, and then uh, followed it up the, the next year on September the 11th again. And, and he, when he said a big idea, it's not just a, a New World Order, he said that's a big idea. Uh, and the big idea is straight out of free, high Freemasonry. They call it the big idea. And, and so September 11th comes along. It's also an occultic date. It's, it's within the Ides of September when, when Minerva is born. And the occult tradition about Minerva is that it's a warrior type that's born from the head of Zeus uh, without the aid of any, any other partner, self-born, self-willed into action. And then you go into chapter 9, verse 11 of Revelations, and that's where you've got the, the beast is released from the bottomless pit. So this is all tied in. These guys love to, to, uh, to, to do it on these particular dates, etc. In fact, I'm sure you're well acquainted of that, that phrase in George Bush's the second inaugural address that he gave on January 20th, 2005, where he talked about when our founders declared a new order of the ages. Mm -hmm. They yeah. were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. It, it was. In fact, when we read the writings, not about Franklin, but the writings by Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, both of them um, stated the same thing, that, that uh, this would be, a, be a, the beginning of a federation of the world. And uh, Franklin went so far as to say it would ultimately be run by 12 wise men, 12 being the, the perfect number of government in the Kabbalah. So these guys were high Kabbalists, no cultists. And Franklin also made a similar reference to, to George Bush Sr. And people have questioned what it meant. Uh, what it was, was that Franklin said he would like to be remembered in history as a single point of light. That's in his own memoirs. And of course, if George Bush referred to a thousand points of light, and those that uh, we'll find repeated so frequently within the occult writings of people like Alice Bailey. But uh, nobody's going to tell the American people that. And if they depend upon Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and, and uh, CBS, ABC, and NBC, all we have to do is look in the right lower quadrant of uh, the CBS screen when it comes on. Uh, that eye there, that is an ancient occult symbol mm -hmm. that the average American is never to realize its significance or the sim significance of the emblem on the back of the dollar bill which they, they hide in plain mm -hmm. sight. And also Theodore Franklin, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt made the same statement when he was going to break all the usual international rules in his day and send some Marines into another country. And when he was questioned about it, he said, he said, the history is made, he said, by men who are single points of light. And he said, these men are sometimes called tyrants, like, like the Neros of Rome and the, and the Napoleons. He says, but these are men who change the world. It matters not, he, he said, uh, what, how they're judged by mankind. And of course, it didn't matter. Uh, the Japanese kept trying to surrender at the end of the Second World War, but they weren't going to let him surrender. They wanted to drop the atom bombs and kill as many people as they could to create as much havoc. And if you doubt that, we actually have an article out of the Chicago Tribune on the very day that they signed the accord of the peace treaty uh, in the harbor in Tokyo Bay. Uh, just call and ask for the, uh, that, that article. The Japanese have been trying to surrender. We wouldn't let them. And the invasion of Iwo Jima and Nagasaki uh, and, uh, uh, and of Okinawa uh, and uh, the dropping of the bombs, totally unnecessary. But when you're dealing with evil, they want as much destruction as absolutely possible. Well, Alan, 
pick up the story there because it, was, it is so difficult for the average individual to understand that we're dealing with organized evil internationally, not just here in this country, but all throughout the world. But all of these people are bound together, or so many of them are bound together, to secret societies. And most people don't even know what the Rosicrucians are, the Templars, or understand the influence of Masonry or the Trilateral Commission or this whole Brotherhood of Darkness we've read about. So you pick up the story there. When we go back to, to even the, the Knights Templars that we see depicted in old Hollywood movies uh, behind King Richard coming back to England to free them and all this kind of thing, it's nonsense. The Knights Templars were definitely a, a, a monk. They were monks, really, warrior monks. And they were uh, to abstain from women. However, in their own writings, and John Dee wrote about it himself, he said they were also accused of of, of um, uh, having to comply with a brother's request for sexual relations. That was mandatory that you could not refuse a brother. So we have a, a, a this, this kind of thing going on with them, the Knights Templars. And, and also, they were the first real international bankers that we know of. Um, so many widows in, in the Crusades were lead, leaving entire estates to the Templars. The Templars had a, a tax-free exemption from the papacy, and they were gathering land from all over Europe. And and they were they released were the first international bankers who who actually used uh, checks instead of of gold uh, money, and you could actually buy so much, so much. Uh, put a deposit in London, take a check with you to the Middle East, and cash it in in one of their banks over there. Uh, it was a world empire they were setting up, but it was an occultic uh, system uh, to do with a, a, a form of elitism um, and, and the worship of entities beyond. Uh, uh, I've heard, and I, maybe you have looked into this, but uh, it was said that, you know, after Jacques de Molay was uh, burned at the stake, you know, in uh, in France in, I don't know, 1308 or 1309, that many of the Templars went to Switzerland and established the banking industry there. Is there any truth to that? Well, in, in 1314, uh, that's when it happened. But you'll find that, you see, this is even older than them. Behind all official history and, and the official kings, there's always another group. And you'll find that when Charlemagne uh, was made the, the, the warrior king uh, that would go through Europe for the papacy and uh, convert countries at the point of the sword, which he did, uh, Charlemagne uh, opened the first uh, bank in Switzerland, and uh, he called it the, the Bank of Sion. And the river that it was built on is still there today. And it's called that same name. So that was back in the, what, the, the 7th century or 8th century. Yeah, I, think, uh, uh, I think it was, he was a, a crowned Holy Roman Empire about 800. So mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, th this is an ancient um, plan, an mm -hmm. uh, ancient plan of secret societies. It's been around really since the beginning of time. It really uh, was tried to act out in the time of, of ancient Babylon where they were going to unite the world under Nimrod. And yeah. And, and that has intervened again and again now through the centuries, hasn't it? So, yes, and that's the mystery part of it. Uh, Babylon, if you try to, to uh, say to a person what Babylon was, it was, it was mystifying because it was an entire system, but behind the system they use a reference that, uh, that um, Isis had a thousand faces, the god of Egypt, or the goddess. Hold that thought right with me back in just a moment here with Ellen Moore. Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty. Our guest is Alan Watt, who, uh, uh, of course, lives in Canada, but he comes from Scotland, as you can tell. Uh, and, of course, he's been studying uh, this. How long have you been studying these secret societies, Alan? I grew up watching them. Even as a boy, I'd watch them. There are so many Masons in Scotland that uh, you can observe them. They're talking to each other in, in the parks and street corners, and you'd see all their strange movements, handshakes, their, uh, the, the way they would talk to each other, the free they would use. It was very, very common. But yeah. do you think the average Mason really understands the occult foundation of Masonry? Uh, not at all. No. Uh, Albert Pike himself, uh, who really put it all in his book, uh, Morals and Dogma, said that the low class Masons or the lower Masons are no different than the profane, but they form a, a portico, an outer portico or a shield 
which protects the, the real ones inside and who are higher up. So, so yeah, the lower ones know very... However, what they do know, uh, and, it's, and that's one thing Masons make sure everyone knows in a society, is that if you do join them, you'll get your advance in your work or your job, and you'll get promotion over, over other people and this, this kind of thing. And, of course, this is really what happens. You get into the Masons, you're in the military, you're going to get promoted to the highest levels of, uh, of the military. Uh, you are certainly in the police. You'll get, at least in many areas, you'll get promoted over people of equal ability. Uh, if you are going to court and you have a Masonic judge, uh, forget it, you're going to lose the case. Uh, and, of course, there's a Mason who's uh, accused of murder or treason or uh, why, of course, he'll be let off if there's a Mason on the jury or if there's a Masonic judge. So you do not have a, a, an opportunity for a real free society when you have secret societies working in our country. And uh, what are there, between two and three million Masons in America today, do you know? Uh, I think there's probably more. Because, you see, ISIS has a thousand names and faces. ISIS is the little covert way to talk about their church. They call it ISIS, the mother. And they are the body of Osiris. You know, the body of Osiris in the myth was broken up. So they are the, the members. They are, <coughs> they are the, they're the body, and ISIS is their church. And ISIS had a thousand names and faces. And when you go into all the different names of the male and female lodges, uh, there's hundreds of them. And you'd never realize it until you go into, into the study of them, what they actually are. Uh, well, of course, I think that um, it was Manny P. Hall in his book, The Lectures on Ancient Philosophy, who said it best. He said, Masonry is a fraternity within a fraternity. And out of fraternity, it made up of people who want to do good and, and like the camaraderie, but in, in a fraternity, of those who study the Ancorum and the Ancorum. And, of course, you've got to look that up in the dictionary. That's the secret and the, the secret of secrets. And what is the secret of secrets? Why Lucifer is God. That, you tap into that force, you'll do very well in this world. Uh, but of course, uh, eternity is an awfully long time. And this is what the average person really doesn't understand. There really are people uh, who, in the world today who worship Lucifer and have tapped into his supernatural power. The odd thing that I've found is the continuity of the same system, even from the, the Greeks. The ancient Greeks uh, and the, the, the oracles at Delphi, uh, they used women for channeling spirits. And when you went in with a question to the oracle, the women who, uh, who they, actually, they, they actually were given drugs, the women, and uh, forms of narcotics. So they'd mumble an answer. The priest would interpret the answer, and, and that was that. But the, traditionally, they've always used women to channel this information all down through the ages up to the present day. I think it's so interesting that Hillary Clinton uh, had, had asked for Jean Houston to come to the White House to channel mm -hmm. uh, the spirits of, uh, of, the, of Eleanor Roosevelt and the hand of Scandi, and everybody thought that was so funny. Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton may be the next president of the United States. Yeah, and, and of course, we know that uh, previous prime ministers in British countries and Commonwealth countries were into it as well. It's no secret that they're, they're all into this type of thing. But I know in the high occultic groups, they still use the, the women primarily for channelers. The interesting thing that the Romans uh, said about it was they used them to predict the future or events and for times of coming wars or, or, or conquests or campaigns. But they would never allow these women who are held in fa high favor, they would never allow them into uh, other meetings where their battle plans were being discussed because they said that once these women had opened the door to the spirits, they could not be closed and they were a two-way street of communication. And of course they didn't want the spirits to know. Well, believe me, the spirits do know whatever you're doing. Yeah. But of course also does our Lord and Savior. And so there is a spiritual battle in this other dimension for the souls of men and the survival of Western civilization. Well, we're going to be back here in a few minutes with uh, Mr. Alan Watt as we begin to explore uh, this other dimension. And if you want to get the documentation on so much of what Alan's covering, why much of it's covered in my book, The Brotherhood of Darkness. And when we get back, I will let Alan tell you about his material. I found it fascinating. I'm so glad I found somebody who is as fascinated with this as I am and recognizes the spirits of battle that we're engaged in today. Well, this is 
Dr. Stan, and our guest is Alan Watt. And Alan, why don't you pick this up, and then we'll let you get your uh, information out on your uh, your work here in just a couple of minutes when our, all of our other stations are back on board. But mm-hmm. basically, as, of course, as you're uh, going through this, and you comment that uh, you know that you find this the, the platonic influence of writing to Plato, mm-hmm. and of course, modern day occultists all go back to Plato. Plato really was almost like a, um, a watershed event in the history of mankind, wasn't it? Didn't he more or less mm-hmm. codify a lot of this? He, he did, and he gave the religion that they believe in uh, a way. He, he told us what the religion is based upon. And the, the religion of the elite in his day, uh, and today in fact, it's no different, was based on a special kind, a special kind of reincarnation. And he, he does that in his dialogues, in his books, where he, he asks the question, why are, why are we so intelligent, we the aristocracy, um, as opposed to the ordinary people? And then he goes through the basis for believing that they were all reincarnated into the same, same family dynasties over and over. So hence the need for the inbreeding of selected families down through the ages to make sure the same spirits come back into the same bodies. That's what they, they believed in. And of course, uh, uh, some of the writings of uh, Albert Pike say exactly the same thing. If you don't get it right the first time, you keep on coming back. Albert Pike was a Civil War general. His statue uh, it sits there in uh, New York City, I mean, in, in Washington, D.C. today. He is buried in the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., uh, the headquarters of international masonry, or at least American masonry. So, pick up the story there. Albert Pike uh, let so much out too. He, he in one uh, one of his uh, parts of Morals and Dogma, he said that the, that the good Mason must uh, get to the top by all means possible, uh, by any even devious means, even using the stock market. He said, and he said then we must subjugate inferior men's minds by our will, and then we shall become the masters over the masters of the world. Now, does that sound like a benevolent organization to you? They shall come to us for their princes and for their, their, their popes. Mm-hmm. Of course, that effect. In other words, he, he made it very clear that they would end up ruling the world mm-hmm. through this secret society. And this is all in Morals and Dogma. You can get a copy, and they're still available in used bookstores, those that haven't been burned. And, of course, uh, people have to understand that they laid everything out. It's all very obvious. They know exactly what they're doing. They just want the American people to know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, Albert Pike, um, we know that he trained uh, Giuseppe Mazzini, which is just an Italian for Mason, <laughs> Mazzini, and he he led off the, the World Revolutionary Party because they use revolutions, the circle, of course, of a revolution to get to their... Hold that stuff right there. And well, I guess is Alan Watt. He's talking about how uh, the uh, the uh, Masons uh, created a man in, in, in Italy known as Giuseppe Mazzini, a uh, word for Mason, and he, of course, formed a a secret society there known as the as the Carbonari, and they were involved in creating the revolutions that would sweep across Europe during the 19th century, and ultimately, then this rebel world revolution uh, went into Russia and created the Russian Revolution in, in 1917 and the Cuban Revolution in 1958, and uh, and the world revolution that is continuing until this day. And if you read Prof- uh, uh, President Bush's uh, inaugural speech, uh, second inaugural speech, where we talked about when our founders declared a new order of the ages, why they were acting on an ancient hope that's meant to be fulfilled. And then he talks about how we're going to bring democracy to nations throughout the world. You know, we're going to bring freedom to people throughout the world. Do you really think we're bringing freedom to the people of Saudi Arabia? When uh, Are we bringing freedom to the people of China? Of course not. We're supporting totalitarian regimes throughout the world. So they use code words to cover what this is about. It's about a world dictatorship under a ruling elite all tied into secret society. So you pick up this oh, story. Alan, do you have a web page or any place where people can... Yes, it's called uh, CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com. CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com. Mm-hmm. What will people find there? They'll find um, uh, a lot of downloadable talks I, I put up there on, on some of this, some of the system uh, as, as it is today, uh, how our minds are shaped today, uh, the people who shaped our minds and basically said that they would control our minds, which I think they've done, 
like like Brzezinski uh, in, in the, uh, between two ages he talks about techniques of controlling the minds of whole populations and um, I go into Charles Galton Darwin uh, the, the direct descendant of Charles Darwin who talks about creating a, a new form of more sophisticated slavery where the people will be unaware they're actually slaves uh, so I got, I got all a lot of information on these guys and their own personal histories in there the Darwin family is fascinating because for, for four or five generations they only interbred with one other family the Wedgwood family of England and Charles Darwin when his, sec when his first wife died uh, he married his aunt another Wedgwood who was his mother's sister total inbreeding in the same family lineages to get the certain genes for, uh, for certain qualities exactly as Plato said that's cutting through the uh, matrix dot com and believe me the matrix is alive and well in our society today go ahead yes so uh, and I also have lots of the masonic symbols up there um, what they really mean because most of the books put out there are put out by masons or at least authorized by masons and they don't give you the real higher meanings of what you're really looking at and what it means um, so I tried to expose that. I give lists of, of uh, uh, various books they can, they can uh, read that's more to the point. The real meanings behind the 33rd degree uh, where the sun sets. That's why Hiroshima, as we mentioned earlier, was bombed. It's in the 33rd degree parallel. It was a, a sign of, of their high power. And um, I also put into three books called Cutting Through uh, 1, 2, and 3. And I'm going to write more of them too in the near future. All right, fine. Now, how can people get those books? Through your website? Through the website, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, fine. So, I mean, it's important that people understand that this goes back to the Kabbalah. So, so terribly significant today. And all uh, Rosie O'Donnell and Madonna and all these people are into the Kabbalah. But the Kabbalah, of course, is mysticism. You know, uh, antedates, of course, the Babylonian captivity. It was simply codified uh, by the Jews people, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the rabbis when they were in captivity. But this antedates that, uh, and of course, it's Christian, the Kabbalah, and there's all sorts of Kabbalah, but they're all trying to tap into this this secret knowledge. Would that be a fair statement? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Hitler had the same with the Viril Society and, and uh, the Tula Society where he had a channeler, his main channeler, who supposedly get channeled information on, on high weaponry, advanced weaponry. And I wouldn't be surprised because you find all the big boys in history who are scientists certainly were all into this channeling. And of course, what they do is they put themselves into a hypnotic state and then they can begin to get this information. This is what, of course, is, is getting into the Christian church all across America today. Oh, what we need is contemplative prayer and meditation. Uh, that's how we're going to, of course, reach God. And of course, we're not reaching God, we're reaching the other dimension. The, the, I have no doubt uh, in that. See, I, I'd love, personally, I would love to be able to explain everything rationally and scientifically, but I've personally had experience of, of uh, people who um, have been directly possessed and have come right to me and, and spoken to me as another person. I've had this happen in my life, so I can't deny it. So, uh, yeah, this, this possession stuff is real. It really is very real, yeah. Uh, in fact, if uh, those uh, our listeners who get the, uh, the DVDs or videos, Megiddo 1 and Megiddo 2, and I've forgotten which one it is, but in one of them they actually have this woman as she goes into possession, and you can see the transformation, or t total transformation, mm -hmm. you know, as she comes under demonic control. It's really amazing, amazing footage. You know, that's, I, I also was in the music business at one time. As a, I was a musician, and, and I did a lot of session work too, and I got to know a lot of these people. I've been in Alistair Crowley's old house when Jimmy Page bought it over. Oh, that was over in Scotland. Yeah, mm -hmm. there, like, like this. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, Alistair Crowley was known as the other a Loch Ness monster. And Alistair Crowley, this this is another tie-in. Uh, he he worked for the British government. Sure, he was in British intelligence, and, and they're working in American intelligence, and I'm sure in British intelligence today. Mm -hmm. And all, so many of the world intelligence agencies tie into the occult. Always, always, and, and I was told from a guy from the British side that uh, MI5 and 6 have a special area. 
outside London called the Cotswolds. So they have an area, a camp there, where they train certain members to go out into the world and create mysticism and confusion. That's, that's what they say. Right. And they back them heavily with money to become authors, and they put out all the New Age stuff. Well, I'll tell you what New Age... Uh, uh books are sweeping across America today. You know, I think there's two authors that have sold together 50 million copies of their books. One of them the Dr. Shopgra, and uh, I forgot what the other one is, but they're so prevalent, and so many Christians buy them, never suspecting that, that these people who talk about, oh, and I was just immersed in the light. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? Of course, mm -hmm. the light that they're talking about is not the light of God, but the light of Lucifer. Yes, this is it's, it's very big amongst them. But what I I noticed even at some of the big parties where the musicians go. Now most musicians, uh, when you get up to a certain level, you're asked to join the OTO. So every professional group in the world has its own little uh, site of masonry, and from musicians and artists, it's generally the OTO they'll join, uh, the Order Templi Orientis. That was Alistair Crowley, of course. Mm -hmm. And that's why, of course, if you look at some, of the, at least one of the Beatles albums, you'll see the picture of Alistair Crowley, the man who created the OTO. And yeah, mm -hmm. beautifully. Have you seen the videos we carry called "They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll"? Mm -hmm. And I've seen at these parties uh, when when um, they're all high on drugs and everything, and you come in there. Uh, and and then and used to fly in women from all over Europe just for the parties. It was like eyes wide shut the movie. And um, and then I, I one of them I saw two men come in who were high priests, and I I literally thought they were Jesuits because of the way they were dressed, and everyone was so different to them and gave them such respect that that's when I clued in these were the high priests of the temple. And, so, and I've seen the same thing here when I was asked to go to a Wiccan wedding. Um, uh, the, the girl who was the high priestess, her parents, uh, her father was a pastor in a church. So I don't think I saw the whole ceremony, but I saw this, the same type of guys come in with the black coats, pants and boots, short haircuts, and I chatted to them. And then the and next time I saw them, they were dressed in their official robes inside the, this temple. This is an amazing place. I didn't know it existed in Ontario. And lots of Masons go there for marriage. And, and the place is called Little Egypt. Little Egypt. Well, of course, that has tremendous occult significance because there was so much occultism in ancient Egypt. Yes. Huh. Well, of course, this has per permeated society down through the ages. Certainly every king and every emperor always had a, a wise man or a shaman or, or a priest or, um, uh, you know, somebody there who, who could tap into these, these spiritual forces. And then, of course, that was what gave the, uh, the ruler or the, uh, the pharaoh, whoever it was, his supernatural power. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we even find it with Alexander the Great, who was taught under Aristotle, who called himself the Fisher Kings, all the way back to Egypt. Uh, these particular um, teachers uh, were called Fisher Kings because they, they, they caught the pupil and trained them for great things in the world, according to the agenda, and they turned them into what they claimed was gods. And today we hear the same term flashed around in the occult societies, you can become as God. It's the same old thing over and over. It's like deja vu all over again, isn't it? Well, we actually have a book written, uh, it's called Plutarch, The Life of Alexander. And it's still available in print. It's written either by Scott Kively or Ivy. And, and if our listeners would like the page out of it, where Alexander uh, the Great writes to uh, Aristotle and says, you trained me in the mysteries and now you've written a book about it and everybody's going to understand and I'll lose my power over men and, and Aristotle writes back and said oh no you have nothing to worry about Alexander you know unless you have been schooled in the mysteries you can read about it all you want but you will never understand them and that's true if I had not known what was the morals and dogma uh, Albert Pike's writing I never could have figured it out on my own knowing what it is it's so obvious and, and in my latest newsletter of course my April newsletter which we'd be glad to send to our listeners we go into Albert Pike's writings where he explains what's going on and, and when you understand what he's talking about it's so obvious and if you were to read that without a little coaching why well, you'd never be able to figure it out you'd come away shaking your head and saying what is he saying it's like when when the President of the United States talks about the angel that rides uh, in the whirlwind and guides the storm, referring back to the uh, revolutionary era of America, and then concludes his speech saying, 
And uh, the story continues. The angel still rides in the whirlwind and is directing this storm, talking about what's going on today. But nobody has any idea what the angel in the whirlwind is. So unless you understand how these people think, they have a different agenda. The message is there in the speeches that they give, and the average American has no idea what they're hearing. Yeah, yes, but Pike said that, that, that uh, we never talk as plainly as we do when the, when the profane are around because they don't understand, they think they know what is being said, but they miss the, the esoteric meanings. And, and they, they do talk plainly, really. If you understand them, they tell you what they're doing and where they're going and why they're doing it all yeah, the time. Chris, have, you, have you been following uh, what's going on here in America today? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, what are your thoughts about the direction our country is taking? Because, of course, Canada will follow the United States. All of them will. Uh, in 1991, uh, Margaret Thatcher came over to Canada, and she was doing a world tour, and um, it, it broke out in the newspaper on a Sunday, and I think the editor must have been off, <laughs> because the, the title of her talk was The New World Order, The Coming New World Order. And uh, she said that the next major war will be on fundamental religion. And she said it will begin with the Middle East, but it will not end there. Well, of course, that's the war we're going into very, very soon. And the average American, why aren't they speaking out? The immigrants are out there demonstrating their rights today. Why aren't the Christians demonstrating against the fact that they're planning on taking us into a war with Iran that will spread to the rest of the Muslim world? Yeah. Well, the Christians, again, uh, I mean, they follow the, the, the ones who are put out on top of their churches or, or the TV evangelists, and, and they're being uh, told, don't worry about anything, it's all in God's hands. You, you don't have to even uh, do anything or worry about it or even participate in anything, really. And so they're out of the picture. They're, this is psychological warfare to get them out of the picture so they don't take an interest. And of course, the thing is that so many Christians believe that they'll be, they'll be or simply raptured away before anything bad happens. But I always say, well, I believe in the rapture, but what happens if it happens uh, 30 years, 20 years after America's fallen and our cities are in rubble? What will you say then? What do you think will happen to the, happen to the faith of, of the American people? It'll be like it was in Ger- Germany after the Second World War and in Europe. Their mm-hmm. churches are empty because they all thought they were going to be raptured away. Mm-hmm. And it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. The great tragedy is today that they have neutralized the Christian church, who should be, of course, pointing out the spiritual battle. And yet very few ministers even want to talk about it. What's so interesting, I have had, oh, within the last month, I've had probably half a dozen ministers from across the country who listen to our programs and are helping to uh, disseminate the information. We need, you know, uh, 500,000 ministers who are doing that. Yeah, see, I, I always say it's the individual person. That the problem with all groups is they can be so easily controlled if you, if you put the right head into them. And, and that's what's always done throughout history. You, you, a large group of people are controlled easily when an opposition puts in their own man at the top. And I always I say this is a battle of the individual for the individual, because the coming society that they plan to create um, is going to be the collective. It's the collective, really. It's the end of individuality as we know it. And they're quite, they had a meeting at Loyola University uh, four years ago that turned out 600 pages. It was a world science meeting with the top uh, bioengineers there. Um, and they say that they have a chip ready to put in the brain, it, that it's been tested, it works, and all they have to do now is convince the public that this will be a good thing for safety, and and they said they promote it uh, as a good thing through cartoons for the children. They said it will be taught in, in, in junior schools as a good thing, and also put it into movies. And sure enough, since that, that meeting, uh, a whole burst of these things have come out, including the movies with the, the Ben benefits of having a chip. However, the, the man from Japan, the main fellow who, in, who was behind this particular chip, uh, and Newt Gingrich was there, by the way, and, it, and this was funded by the U.S. Department of Commerce, so the U.S. taxpayer paid for all this and doesn't know about it. Um, and the man from Japan said, it says, this will be the end of individuality. Everyone will be connected to major computers in regional areas. And he said, you'll hear the whispers of others' thoughts going through your head as the messages go back and forth. He said, think of it more like the hive. 
Now we know that, that the beehive is highly symbolic in masonry, has been for thousands of years, and uh, that's what they're referring to. The perfect society will be a form of beehive. But if we jump from there, from the Loyola University meeting, World Science meeting, back to Charles Galt and Darwin, he said, we the elite will not alter ourselves. He said, because we must retain our abilities for self-preservation, but the masses will not need it anymore because the state will be making all their decisions for them. And that, of course, is exactly what's going on today. In the name of fighting the wicked Osama bin Laden, incidentally, uh, my information is he's been dead for some time. But don't you worry. They'll always, of course, uh, it'll rejuvenate him, and they'll have his picture up on television, and you'll hear a voice that the CIA assures you was his voice. Uh, we need a boogeyman, and of course, then we'll rally behind uh, Big Brother, who will protect us from uh, the wicked Osama bin Laden. Well, ladies and gentlemen, understand how they play games with our minds, but more than that, we're involved in the spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization. And most people don't even know the battle is going on. We'll be back in just a moment with our special guest, Alan Watt. Well, Alan, you've got three minutes to wrap up the program today. It's been fascinating. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed talking to you. Yes, it's, it's, it's a fascinating subject because there's so much material uh, and so many things you could actually say about it in a world which doesn't know, and, and many of the people don't care to know, uh, but it's so so real, it's documentable, um, you follow the whole route of this down through time, uh, thousands of years towards the uh, uh, fulfillment, and they believe they're almost at, at their, their goal now. But they're not far to go. They, they have to standardize the world. They're standardizing the entire planet for world government. And this world government is not going to be a benevolent uh, government. It's going to be one where um, everything in your life will be decided for you. You will have no say in anything. And according to the Cecil Rhodes Group that helped to, 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 to build the League of Nations, in fact, they were behind that, uh, they said that um, perfect peace will come when the people themselves are docile uh, and, and pliable to our will. That's where they have most of the people today, unfortunately. And so it's time now for the individual in society to stand up and, and inform themselves, with, uh, arm themselves with knowledge. And, and I've said they must demand that everybody who takes a paycheck from the public any civil servant, a policeman whoever, your local government you must demand to have all the societies that they have joined out in the open and you must know what oaths they have taken and whom to and what for because they will make rules over you yeah. Of course you can't have a secret society so we have them openly operating in America today and they, they work behind the scenes it's not only the, uh, the uh, uh, Masons who are here but the Rosicrucians are here and there are other secret societies that have secret oaths where you swear allegiance to that organization and those oaths supersede uh, your oath to the United States and, and your oath to uphold our constitution and defend it against all enemies uh, foreign and domestic and believe me we have an awful lot of domestic enemies that are intent upon destroying the very fabric of our society Alan thank you so very much I hope we can get you back on our programs in the near future it'd be a pleasure yeah. bye bye one, one more time get your website out mm -hmm. yes cuttingthroughthematrix.com cuttingthroughthematrix.com you can get Alan's books there and uh, uh, maybe uh, we can even get some copies of those and we can uh, do some more programs on this it's so vitally important that people do understand there always have been secret societies those secret societies are operating right here in the United States today Alan Watt thank you so very much for being with us it's a pleasure